and welcome to another video lecture on topic C1.2, cell respiration. This is our additional higher level content. SL friends, you are not responsible for this on assessments. Our guiding questions, what are the roles of hydrogen and oxygen in the release of energy in cells? And how is energy distributed and used inside cells? Our objectives for today, we're going to describe the structure and function of NAD and its counterpart, NADH plus H plus. We're going to define reduction and oxidation reactions. We're going to describe the steps involved in glycolysis as well as in link reaction and Krebs cycle. We're going to explain the relationship between proton gradients and chemiosmosis and oxygen's role as the final electron acceptor. We're going to explain the regeneration of NAD in anaerobic fermentation, and then we're going to wrap up with a compare and contrast of carbohydrates and lipids as substrates for respiration. This typical molecule is known as NAD or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. You just need to know NAD is plenty sufficient. It's commonly known as an electron carrier molecule. That's not a super fabulous name because it also carries hydrogen ions. Those hydrogen ions we sometimes refer to as protons, and this makes sense because if we had a hydrogen atom, that would be one proton and one electron. If we stole its electron to turn it into an ion, all that would be left would be that proton in the nucleus of the hydrogen. And so hydrogen ions or protons, totally the same things. Sometimes we shortcut with H plus another way to say hydrogen ion or proton. These NAD plus molecules can grab onto some hydrogen, so you can see how this guy has an extra hydrogen here. There are also some uh, electrons in the bond that's there. And so these molecules, electron carrier molecules, which are also proton carrier molecules, can simply shuffle these electrons and protons around the mitochondria. And we're going to talk about how important that is when we get to electron transport chain functions. We have some words to talk about how this guy can gain a hydrogen and some electrons, and then how it can lose that hydrogen and those electrons and go back to that NAD plus version. We call that oxidation and reduction. There are a couple nice mnemonic devices to help us remember what is reduction and what is oxidation. I kind of like Leo says Gur because lions are super cute. Um, when we lose electrons, that is oxidation. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Gain electrons is reduction. A gain of electrons is reduction. This isn't the most fabulous of mnemonic devices because it implies only electrons can be gained or lost, but in fact, protons can also be gained or lost. So another mnemonic device that you could remember is oil rig, and this one is not electron specific, so it's kind of better in that way, but oil rigs are not nearly as cute as our lions. But anyhow, uh, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. So here we've got some molecule NAD+, the, the nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide molecule that we looked at on the previous slide is going to grab onto some hydrogens and some electrons from that organic molecule. We're going to talk about how glucose is often that organic molecule. When this guy gains those electrons and protons from that organic molecule, it is reduced. It becomes this other molecule, NADH plus H plus, and this guy has more energy than does this guy. So it is an electron and proton, but also a little bit of an energy carrier molecule. And then, of course, that organic molecule is down those protons and electrons, and so we say that it is oxidized. Oxidized is the loss of electrons and protons. Reduction is the gain of electrons and protons. This is a chemical equation for respiration. Here we have our glucose and the oxygen producing carbon dioxide and water. This is a reduction oxidation reaction. Our oxygen is going to be reduced. That oxygen gains some hydrogens as well as some electrons. Oxygen is reduced. That glucose is oxidized. Glucose is going to lose lots of electrons and lots of protons as it's broken down into carbon dioxide. All of those electrons and protons that are lost by glucose are gained by oxygen. So respiration is a reduction oxidation reaction. Glucose loses 
electrons and protons, while oxygen gains electrons and protons. Glycolysis is the first stage of respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. It is metabolism because it is an enzyme-mediated set of chemical reactions. There are, oh my gosh, so, so many enzymes. Um, here we have hexokinase, and here we have phosphoglucose isomerase. We have phosphofructokinase 1. Luckily, my friends, we do not need to memorize all the names of all the enzymes, we just need to know that there are a lot of enzymes involved. There are four main steps for glycolysis. The first one is phosphorylation. Phosphorylation literally means just adding a phosphate group. We're going to add a phosphate group to glucose. Here's our glucose molecule. We're going to add a phosphate group. That phosphate group comes from ATP. We're going to add another phosphate group that also comes from ATP. This phosphorylation, adding phosphate groups to the glucose, shakes it around, gives it some extra energy, and that allows our glucose molecule to get broken into two chunks. That is the lysis part of glycolysis, literally the splitting the lysis of that sugar. Carbon up, or in glucose, glucose up here, glucose had one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. These two guys that we just made in the lysis of the glycolysis, one, two, three, one, two, three carbons. We go from six carbons, we split it, we now have three and three. That is the lysis or, or splitting of the glucose molecule stage of glycolysis. We also have some oxidation. So these two, three carbon chunks are going to lose some electrons. Those electrons and the protons that get lost are picked up by the amazing NAD+. It is reduced, gains those electrons to become NADH and H+. So we are going to grab onto those electrons and protons that are lost by these guys and and turn that into NADH. That's the oxidation of these three carbon molecule pieces of glucose. It's also the reduction of the NAD plus to NADH plus H plus. Last but not least, very much not least, is some ATP formation. So we're actually going to make ATP, two of them here and two more of them here, before we get to our final products, which are two molecules of pyruvate. Pyruvate is the final product of glycolysis. We're going to make one, two, three, four ATP molecules. We needed one, two to make all this happen. We get four out of the process. So I lost two ATPs, but I gained four. That's a net gain of two ATPs. We're going to talk when we get to anaerobic respiration about how a little bit of ATP is way better than no ATP. Um, and so this gain of two ATP molecules is super important. That pyruvate that was formed at the end of glycolysis, if there is sufficient oxygen available, if we've got lots of oxygen available, then that pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria. We're actually going to go all the way to the matrix of the mitochondria. The matrix is the middle of the mitochondria. Ooh, matrix. Um, so this pyruvate that we made in glycolysis is going to diffuse into the matrix of the mitochondria. There we have lots more enzymes that are going to first decarboxylate, decarboxylate that pyruvate. This just means we're chopping off a carboxyl group. That's going to end up as CO2. So this pyruvate, it had three carbons. We're going to chop off a carbon here that carbon is the waste product carbon dioxide. And so what's left are just two carbons. The two carbons that are left over from that pyruvate after it gets decarboxylated, those two carbons are known as an acetyl group. That acetyl group then gets stuck onto this CoA enzyme and the combination of acetyl and coenzyme A are known as acetyl CoA. That acetyl group again has two carbons, two left over. From the three that we started with, one other carbon is here. The other thing that happens is a little bit more oxidation. So I like to think of the decarboxylation, um, the breaking up of our glucose molecules and all the little pieces that result from the breaking up of glucose. I like to think of it as like a cookie. 
and every time we break the cookie, there are some crumbs, and those crumbs are electrons and protons. And so every time we break off a carbon, we're going to get some electrons and some hydrogen or proton crumbs, and those guys get gobbled up by NAD+, and that guy is reduced to NADH plus H+. Plus. So we're going to oxidize this chunk of pyruvate as it is decarboxylated, we're going to then reduce the NAD plus into the reduced form, the form that has the extra electrons and protons, the NADH and H plus. Again, this guy is going to be super important. It is one of our electron carrier molecules. And again, that name is not fabulous because it also carries protons, which is super important. So again, we started with glucose. In glycolysis, we split the glucose into pyruvates. Those pyruvates with sufficient oxygen will enter the mitochondria, the matrix of the mitochondria. We're going to decarboxylate it, chop off a CO2 group. We're going to also oxidize what's left over. We're going to grab onto some electrons and some protons. NAD plus is going to grab onto those electrons and protons. The two carbons that are left over from the pyruvate we now call an acetyl group. That acetyl group is going to jump onto coenzyme A to form acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA that we make in the link reaction is going to enter Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Here, notice that we could also introduce fatty acids. So we can start with glucose. We can use that glucose um, in glycolysis in the link reaction to get down to that acetyl group. There's another pathway that we can use to digest our fatty acids and turn them into acetyl groups that can get stuck onto coenzyme A, and then we can enter Krebs cycle. This is where we add our lipids into aerobic respiration processes. That acetyl-CoA, regardless of whether we get it from glucose or fatty acids, is going to enter Krebs cycle. And the first thing that happens is coenzyme A just pops right up, right back off. So, so we had that acetyl group that we got from the pyruvate. We stuck it onto coenzyme A. We enter Krebs cycle, and the first thing that happens is that CoA just pops right back off. We're left with the acetyl group. The acetyl group is going to get bound to this molecule, oxaloacetate. We do need to memorize oxaloacetate. Acetyl plus oxaloacetate forms this molecule citrate. You need to know that. Acetyl from acetyl-CoA that we got from the pyruvate that we got from glycolysis, acetyl is going to bind to oxaloacetate, an enzyme makes this happen, and we're going to make some citrate. Luckily, those are the only two guys that you need to memorize. The rest of them know that there are lots of other things, other intermediates involved. We don't need to memorize all of them. We need to memorize acetyl plus oxaloacetate makes citrate. That citrate is then decarboxylated. We're going to chop off some carbon dioxide. We're going to chop off some more carbon dioxide, and that is going to pretty much take apart all of that acetyl group that was left over, right? Because the acetyl group had two carbons. There goes one, there goes the other one. What's left over is stuff that eventually gets turned back into oxaloacetate that can then bind to another acetyl group to turn into citrate, and the whole thing can happen all over again. Decarboxylation. We're chopping off the carbons that were on the pyruvate that were part of the original glucose molecule. We also have some oxidation happening. We call that oxidation dehydrogenation because we're stealing hydrogens, we're also stealing electrons. So oxidation, losing electrons and protons or hydrogens dehydrogenation. That enzymes we often will call, hold on, I scribbled on top of them, dehydrogenase because we're literally taking off the hydrogens. And if it ends in an ace, it's an enzyme dehydrogenase carries out the dehydrogenation of our acetyl groups, and we're going to put those protons and electrons onto the amazing electron and proton carrier molecule, NAD+, to turn it into reduced NAD plus H+. Plus. Feeling pretty good? Feeling pretty good. So Krebs cycle, we're basically taking apart all of the glucose that was left over what we have is an energy and proton electron transfer to our NAD plus um, molecules. And we're going to talk about what do even we do with all of that NAD plus that's been reduced to NADH plus H plus. 
A quick review of what we've done so far. Glycolysis occurred here in the cytoplasm of the cell. We split that glucose down into a couple pieces. Those pieces are pyruvate pieces. We also made some NADH plus H plus, all the little crumbs of electrons and protons that fall off of glucose when we break it. That pyruvate is going to enter when we have sufficient oxygen available. The matrix of the mitochondria the matrix of the mitochondria. Here the link reaction happens in the link reaction. That pyruvate is further broken down. We now have an acetyl group. We also get a little bit more NADH and H+. The acetyl group is going to bind onto coenzyme A and enter Krebs cycle. That's also happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. So, so we've got Krebs happening here. We had the link also happening here. Glycolysis is out in the cytoplasm. In the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, we are continuing to break down our acetyl group. We have lots and lots more NADH plus H plus being formed, which means that we now have in the matrix of the mitochondria lots and lots of NADH. NADH has lots of protons and lots of electrons. We're going to talk about the electrons first. Those electrons that are being carried away from glycolysis, from the link reaction, from Krebs cycle, those electrons that we stole from glucose are going to be transferred to the electron transport chain. Its job is to transport electrons. You probably guessed that already. We have this chain of proteins. All these proteins, these proteins are all embedded in the inner membrane, the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Those electrons are going to jump, 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 jump along the electron transport chain. What's super cool about jumping electrons is that there's an energy transfer. The energy of those electrons jumping along the electron transport chain is transferred to those proteins. Those proteins use the energy from those jumping electrons to pump hydrogen ions. Those also came from NADH+. And we're going to pump those protons into the space between the membranes. Remember that mitochondria have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And the space between the membranes is known as the intermembrane space. Literally, the space between the membranes, the intermembrane space. So we have all of these hydrogen ions in the matrix. The energy from the electrons jumping on the electron transport chain is used by the proteins of the electron transport chain to bump those protons, H pluses, into the intermembrane space. The intermembrane space. We now have a high concentration gradient of all these hydrogen ions. We have lots and lots of H pluses floating around in our intermembrane space. The universe is not stable if I have a bunch of stuff hoarded all together. And so that hydrogen is going to tend toward moving away from other hydrogens. It's going to want to spread out. When I say want, I don't mean like they have likes and dislikes. They will just be more stable, more energetically favorable if they spread out. So all these protons, these protons need to get back to will be more stable uh, if they're not all hoarded together in this intermembrane space, which is kind of a tiny space. Look, there's not much space there. So what those hydrogens do? Because they have that charge, they can't get through the fatty acids of the phospholipid bilayer that makes up both the outer and the inner membranes of the mitochondria. And so their only option is this guy right here. This guy is called ATP synthase. So all those hydrogen ions that got pumped out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space, they are going to flow through ATP synthase. What's crazy cool is that the kinetic energy of the movement of those protons, so many protons because we pumped them all over there, the movement of those protons back into the matrix, that kinetic energy is used by ATP synthase to glue together, finally, ADP and inorganic phosphate to make ATP. This is where we finally make lots and lots and lots of ATP. So again, what happens is NADH brings its electrons 
gives them to the electron transport chain. The electrons jump, 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 jump. That gives energy to the proteins of the electron transport chain. That energy is used by those proteins to pump the hydrogens into the intermembrane space. We now have a very high concentration of hydrogens. We call this a proton gradient because hydrogen ions are also called protons, we have a very high proton gradient. That means I've got lots of things that are positively charged over here and not a lot of things that are positively charged in the matrix. And that gradient, that difference in concentration, is making things very super unstable. It's wiggly and jiggly, which means it's got energy. That energy is then transferred to ATP synthase as those hydrogen ions get back into the matrix, try to get back to equilibrium, and they flow through ATP synthase, and that energy is used by ATP synthase to make ATP from inorganic phosphate and ADP. Super crazy cool, right? Here is a close-up look at ATP synthase. Again, ATP synthase is bound um, in the membrane of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So here's that inner membrane, here's ATP synthase. A part of it is fully embedded in the membrane, and then there's this other little part that kind of hangs under. What's crazy cool, as those hydrogen ions are flowing from the intermembrane space back into the matrix, of the mitochondria, that energy of the hydrogen ions flowing through it literally causes this guy to twist a little bit like a carousel. And that twisting of ATP synthase allows it to have the energy to glue together ADP and inorganic phosphate to make that ATP. Crazy cool. But wait, there's more. What? How could there possibly be more? Remember those electrons that we got from NADH? They jump, 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 jump. There are a specific number of places where these guys can jump, and there's only space for one electron on each one of those spaces. And so at the end of the electron transport chain, those electrons have to go someplace. They can't just like float back into the matrix. They've got to be stuck to something. NADH doesn't want them anymore. And so we're going to give them to something else. Oxygen. Oxygen comes in as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. When oxygen takes this electron off, that frees up this spot for this guy to jump, which frees up this spot for this guy to jump, which frees up this spot for this guy to jump. If we don't have electrons being taken away from the electron transport chain by oxygen, then the electron transport chain stops. We have to remove those electrons to make space for more electrons to jump. And oxygen's job is to take those electrons away at the end of the electron transport chain. It also is going to grab onto some hydrogens. And when I add some hydrogens and some electrons to oxygen, we get water. Electrons are taken away from the electron transport chain by oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and we make some water. This is happening in the inner membrane. Those um, electron transport chain proteins bound to the inner membrane of the mitochondria. We take those electrons away, bind them to some oxygen, give them some protons too, make some water, and voila, we can keep doing all of that stuff. But what if... I'm running too fast to get the oxygen to my mitochondria efficiently enough. Or what if I'm power lifting so much that my body can't get the oxygen to my muscles fast enough? What then? What happens to our electron transport chain? It does stop. But luckily, we have a backup plan. And that backup plan was the little bit of ATP that we get out of glycolysis. But here's the problem. If I turn all of my NAD plus into NADH in glycolysis, then I don't have any more NAD plus. And if I don't have any more NAD plus, then I can't make ATP in glycolysis. And so the whole purpose of this anaerobic process, this fermentation process, is to oxidize our NADH, turn it back into NAD plus so that I can do glycolysis again so I can at least get a little bit of ATP. Because a little bit means that I can stay alive. Zero ATP is not good for us at all.
There are two pathways for organisms to oxidize the NADH, turn it back into NAD+. The first one, the kind of boring one, is what we humans do, what a lot of other animals do. We're going to take that pyruvate and we're going to reduce the pyruvate to oxidize the NADH. That pyruvate becomes a molecule called lactate. We can also call it lactic acid, but that allows the NADH to turn back into NAD+, and then we can do glycolysis again and at least get a little bit of ATP. Lactate is what makes our muscles sore after big workouts. That lactate um, eventually is sent to the liver for processing. What's super cool about organisms like yeast, yeast do not turn their extra pyruvate into lactate. Instead, they decarboxylate, there goes a CO2, the pyruvate, and then the rest of pyruvate is converted into ethanol molecules. This is how we make wine. And this is how we make beer. So in brewing, making wine and beer, alcohol, ethanol, we take that pyruvate that's made in glycolysis, anaerobic fermentation, and we end up with ethanol, super important in brewing. But wait, also, we do this yeast fermentation when we make bread. So how bread rises, the yeast that we add to the bread dough is eating the sugar that we add to the bread dough, does some glycolysis, does some fermentation, and then the bread is rising because of the CO2 molecules that are popping off of the pyruvate in that anaerobic fermentation process. So the whole job of anaerobic fermentation is to oxidize our NADH, turn it back into NAD+, so that I can do more glycolysis to make at least a little bit of ATP. We're going to regenerate our NAD+, so that we can make some ATP in glycolysis. Because if I turn all of my NAD+, into NADH, we're kind of stuck. Good. I've been talking a lot about glucose, glucose as our starting substrate for all things respiration, but we can also use some lipids. And so here we're going to do just a quick compare and contrast carbs versus lipids in respiration. One of the benefits of glucose, of carbohydrates, um, is that I can send them through glycolysis. I also have that anaerobic process that we can use to get some ATP out of carbohydrates. Lipids are limited to only aerobic respiration. We introduce the acetyl group that we get from um, fatty acids into Krebs cycle. So we can do Krebs and then the electron transport chain oxidative phosphorylation. We can do that with our lipids. Um, we cannot use our lipids in anaerobic respiration. Lipids are also not involved in glycolysis. That's a carb only thing. But what's a benefit to lipids is that there is a whole lot more energy stored per gram of lipid. So we can get 39, almost 40 kilojoules of energy per gram of lipid. All of that energy is used to glue the ADP and the inorganic phosphate back together to make some ATP. Lots more energy available to do lots more gluing of the ADP and the inorganic phosphate. And that's because lipids have fewer oxygens and they have more oxidizable carbons and hydrogens. So when we're getting the energy out of these molecules, it's because we can um, steal electrons and protons away. If I have more carbons and more hydrogens, I have more protons and electrons available to steal, which means that we've got more NADH plus H plus being formed, more energy available to make lots and lots of ATP. Our carbs have more oxygen. It is not as oxidizable as are the carbons and the hydrogens. So there's just fewer electrons and protons available to steal. Um, we just don't have as many oxidizable pieces in the carbohydrates as we do in our lipids. And so there's just a little bit less energy, 15, almost 16 kilojoules per gram, as opposed to 40. But again, benefit of the glucose, we can do glycolysis, and we also have that backup plan for anaerobic respiration. And on that note, my friends, we have arrived at the end of our video lecture. Um, we talked about the structure and function of NAD, how it is reduced to make NADH plus H plus. That reduction is a gaining of electrons and protons. Oxidation is the loss of those electrons and protons. We talked about glycolysis 
it has the um, phosphorylation. We add the phosphate groups from the ATP. We lyse that glucose. We split it into two pieces. They are pyruvates. We talked about oxidation. We steal electrons and protons away from the glucose and give it to NAD to make the NADH plus H plus. We also talked about some ATP production. We get a little bit of ATP out of glycolysis and a little bit is better than none. We described the link reaction. We're going to um, decarboxylate that pyruvate that we made in glycolysis. We talked about Krebs cycle. We continue to decarboxylate the pieces that are left over. We make lots and lots of NADH plus H plus an electron and proton carrier molecule. We're going to pump some protons into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. Chemiosmosis, I definitely forgot to say that word earlier. Chemiosmosis, that's just the coupling of the formation of the ATP to the movement of the protons through ATP synthase. We talked about oxygen's role as the final electron acceptor. We talked about how anaerobic fermentation allows us to turn the NADH back into NAD so that we can do more glycolysis to get at least a little bit of ATP. And then we compare it and contrast carbs and lipids as the substrates for respiration both have some advantages and disadvantages and on that note my friends we did it